All right. Well, hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining the session on Isla Urbana and the Mexican water crisis. Um, so this session is part of Bellevue College's Earth Week, where we're exploring topics around the theme of resilience and action, stronger together, uh, which focuses on the interconnectedness of people and the planet to create a thriving community and just future. Um, so my name is Alyssa Gordon. I am from the Bellevue College Office of Sustainability. We've got a really great lineup of events this whole week. Um, so make sure you take a look at the full schedule um, by visiting our website, and we'll put that link in the chat for everyone. Um, before we get started, uh, we just have a few uh, Zoom details to go over. I know by now we're all pros, but just wanted a brief refresh. Um, so all participants are muted, um, and we ask that you, you know, stay muted throughout the presentation unless you're prompted um, by Sol um, or myself or Sarah. Um, also, feel free to keep your camera on if you'd like. Um, totally up to you. Um, as a note, the session is being recorded, um, so, you know, do whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, throughout the session, um, feel free to put any comments or questions in the chat box. Um, remember to be kind and treat everyone with respect there. Um, and there will be a little bit of time at the end um, to have um, some of your questions answered. And if you're having any um, technical difficulties during the session, uh, you can private message me and I will be happy to assist. Um, so lastly, I'd like to um, pause to acknowledge that Bellevue College resides on the traditional and occupied land of the Coast Salish peoples, past, present, and future. That includes, but is not limited to, Snoqualmie, Suquamish, Duwamish, Nisqually, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot. We honor their connection to the region, pay respect to Coast Salish elders, past and present, and stand in solidarity through their struggles with continued systemic oppression. We commit to care for the land and water and center equity at the core of our own learning. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our country, um, state, and institution are built. We remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to the U.S. from Africa, from the African continent, and recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of the country and continue to serve within our labor force. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Finally, we acknowledge that our institution relies on hourly student contingent and unpaid labor, and we recognize those contributions. All right, so now I'm going to take a moment to, to, to introduce our speaker for today's session, Sol Garcia. Sol is a California native who moved to Mexico City in 2016 to work for Isla Urbana, a Mexican nonprofit and social enterprise focusing on providing clean and sustainable access to water through rainwater harvesting. She oversees Isla Urbana's USA and US nonprofit supporting Isla Urbana's projects throughout Mexico, while also focusing on building young U.S. student leaders through a summer program and other unique opportunities. All right, so without further ado, I'll let Sol take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. And, you know, after hearing your acknowledgments, uh, wow, like even more excited and inspired and that just really set the tone. So thank you for that. Uh, so much respect for that honestly. Um, uh, so you've introduced me and I appreciate that. And um, today I am going to touch on um, the water situation in Mexico, but I am going to focus uh, more on Mexico City because Mexico City is such a case study and you will certain, soon learn why, um, and our work um, throughout the country as Isla Urbana. So let me just jump right in. Um, so that we can hopefully have a little bit of time at the end for questions. Um, if there isn't time at the end, I will definitely leave my contact information so that you can contact me personally. Uh, let's see. So let me share my screen. And we're going to do, oh no, hold on. Oh, hold on. That's not what I wanted because I want to make sure I have the presenter view. Yeah, here we go. Much better. All right, cool. So just to clarify up front, um, what is Isla Urbana? Um, so Isla Urbana is, and I'm not getting my presenter view, so that's not good. I'll be doing this without my notes. I can make this happen, don't worry. 
Um, so Isla Urbana is um, a social project uh, which was founded in 2009 um, here in Mexico City. Um, it is both a social enterprise and it's also a nonprofit. Um, and it was founded by very young individuals. Um, and when I say very young, that's because I'm in my 40s. So of course I'm thinking, you know, they're 20 year olds, they were very young. Um, and they're an amazing group um, that, you know, even though I started working here in Mexico City in 2016, when I met them in 2010, um, I was insanely very impressed. Um, so it's a group of very diverse um, people who are biologists, anthropologists, um, engineers and designers. Um, and Isla Urbana USA, which I work with and I oversee, is a 501c3 nonprofit in the US um, that supports Isla Urbana's uh, projects in Mexico, which uh, are focused on rainwater harvesting, on providing a clean um, and sustainable access to water through rainwater harvesting. Um, and as noted, you know, we focus on um, also building young student leaders um, and I'll in the US, and I will mention how in, in a little bit. Um, so, you know, I think that one thing that, you know, you're going to hear a lot while you're this whole week, um, you'll hear some about the world water crisis, but you're also going to hear just about, you know, climate change and a lot of things that happen that are happening. And I really want to set the tone um, for an alarm that's been sounded that I'm sure many of you know about, but you know, when it comes to clean drinking water, we have 2 billion people on our planet who have limited access to safe drinking water. We have millions of children, and this is from the World Health Organization just a few months ago, um, millions of children and family that don't have adequate access to wash, which are water and sanitation services, including, you know, just soap to wash their hands. Um, at least 1.4 million people, many of them kids, die from preventable um, causes linked to unsafe water and poor sanitation. Um, half of all healthcare facilities lack water, um, soap, alcohol-based hand sanitizing solutions. Um, I mean, half of them. So half of healthcare facilities in our world don't have that. By 2025, um, half of the world's population will be living in water stressed areas. That's now, basically now. Um, so I just, I wanna say that upfront uh, because this is an alarm that's been sounded. So we need to all take that very seriously yesterday. Um, and it's important that we set the tone with this level of urgency. Um, now, when it comes to Mexico, there's 21.3 million of Mexicans that don't have access to uh, running water. In Mexico City, um, you have 250,000 250, uh, residents that are not connected to the central water network. Now, we have an interesting water management problem um, and central water network. That's, you know, like how we all grow up, you know, we just turn on the faucet or we take a shower, we don't think twice, water just comes out. There's 250,000 people that don't have that uh, in Mexico City alone. Um, and then this water management issue that we have, which is pretty substantial, is that 70% of our water um, is pumped from underneath um, and we are over exploiting our aquifers by 200%. And that's causing Mexico City to sink, like Venice, we're sinking. Um, if you've ever come and visited Mexico City, which I suggest you do, it's a great place to tour. Um, you know, you can go to one of the well-known monuments, the El Angel de Independencia, and there you may not notice that we have to keep adding steps to that monument. Uh, if you go to the Zócalo, you might see that the Zócalo is leaning to uh, different parts of it are leaning to the side or slanted. So you take a picture and you're like, wait, did I take that picture? Is it crooked or what's going on here? You go in the church and you're like, okay, this feels off. It's because of that issue. Um, so 70%, we um, extract way too much water uh, over exploding aquifers. And then 30% of the water we pump from um, 330 kilometers away. Um, and that's about 200 miles, I believe. Um, and sadly, of that water that is pumped from over 200 miles away, 60% gets lost in leaks. Um, and at the same time in Mexico City, it rains enough to fill uh, the uh, Stadio Azteca, which is uh, one of the largest football stadiums in the world. Um, I wanna say it's the top three 
largest in Latin America and top eighth in the world, uh, which can be filled a thousand times over um, each year uh, because we have so much rain um, due to severe floods. So we have this interesting situation where um, we have these severe issues uh, with water, water scarcity, water management problems. And at the same time, we have an abundance of water falling from the sky being gifted to us. So it's a very interesting situation. And that is why um, it's important to talk about Mexico City. Um, this is where we started our work. This is where we're based because it is such a case study. Let's see. Um, this picture is commonplace here. Um, you know, because we are an overpopulated mega city, um, there are over 23 million people in Mexico City. So you have situations like urban sprawl, and it's very common that um, you'll have, you know, informal housing and like this house where you, you see the first floor, it probably started that way. Someone just built a house there. And then with time, they built the second floor and the third floor. And it's not like one or two people are living there. That's for um, their entire family. So there's various individuals living there. And it's very common that you would see this. Um, what's great about this picture is that uh, it not only shows like that, but it also show how you can adapt a rainwater harvesting system to this kind of changing situation. Um, on the top left, you might see, you might see it, you'll see it in a moment, um, but it's the blue box. Um, that little blue box is the first flush. If you start really paying attention, you'll see the gutters that are coming down and on the bottom right, you will see a large cistern. So it, as the house expands or grows or changes, you just really change the gutters and you can put, uh, place things in different places. I think, yeah, this is also a common place where when you come to Mexico City and just many places throughout Mexico, if you look above on the roofs, you'll see these containers. Uh, and that's where a lot of the water gets pumped up and then distributed throughout the home. So it's very common. And what's great is that this is really part of what's needed to harvest the rain. And so a lot of this infrastructure is already existing, right? A lot of homes already have cisterns uh, because when the network water is sent, if they're lucky to, enough to get network water, well, then it's often collected in cisterns or in containers also. Uh, and then you have these containers um, that I said that are on the roofs. And then this is something else that's common. Uh, you will get a lot of people who are up in the mountains and they're not connected to the water network. They have their water containers that they have to bring out on certain days at certain times. And I say that very generally because you have these trucks where you see in the bottom uh, middle picture, uh, they're called pipas and they're water trucks that come and deliver water. And some of them have a schedule, some of them have kind of a schedule. And that's a serious problem because a lot of our family members that we talk to, that we work with, they're waking up at four or five in the morning, going outside in their pajamas in the dark, waiting for these people to show up. Uh, they're also, you know, sometimes not getting very good quality water. Sometimes they don't show up for weeks. And so we have situations where we have family members and individuals that are not taking their students, their kids to school that day because they're waiting for the water to arrive. They didn't make it to work on time or they didn't make it to work because they're waiting for their water to arrive. If you're not collect, uh, connected to the water network, you might also be still getting your water by donkey. If you were to come to Mexico City, you wouldn't necessarily think that. Um, you know, if you're coming just a tour, you wouldn't necessarily see that situation. But when you go to the peri-urban outskirts of the city, you will definitely see something like that. And you will see donkeys that are still delivering your water. And then bottom right, you see a picture of the floods again. And, um, the left, bottom left, is more something you would see in a rural setting. Uh, she at least has a wheelbarrow, thank goodness. But you know, these are individuals that have to walk long distances in very rural areas with very heavy containers. And yes, they are often not only in Mexico but worldwide women and children that have to do this, which come with a lot of problems and a lot of risks that I'm going to touch on in a moment. Um, this is a picture of flooding. Um, just what it really looks like. And it's, you might want to be catching your bus, but you have to first get off and try and make it out of there. 
It's very common here. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the, the history uh, of Isla Urbana. Uh, Isla Urbana started in 2009. We have founders that are uh, Mexicans and binationals also, and two of them went to the uh, Rhode Island School of Design. And so when they got out of school, they really wanted to return to Mexico and put their education to work in a way that made a tangible difference for marginalized communities. Um, they started to interview people and saw clearly that there was a great interest in improving their water situation. Of course, they, they knew about the situation, but then when you start to talk to some people, um, mm -hmm. you can see a little bit more that the seriousness when you start to really hear it firsthand. Um, so what happened here is they opened up an office right across the street and the bottom picture is Clara Gaitan. So Clara is the very first beneficiary. They opened up the office right in front of her home. Um, and really Clara became this grandmother to the project, rest in peace. And she passed away last year, I believe. And, you know, when they installed in her home, they started to see that eight months of water was being covered. The needs, the family's needs were being covered for eight months of water. Um, they started to in install at her neighbor's home. Um, and it just became like this living laboratory where they can easily just cross the street and talk to the neighbor and a phone call can I come right over and see how things are evolving, kind of trial and error. Um, and it's very different when you're doing that and you're literally living there. And so that's how this all got started. And it was beautiful to see that this is something that really can make a big difference. This is um, uh, Tlaloque, this blue box is called a Tlaloque. And it is the first flush. It is a very important, most important component of the rainwater harvesting system. I'm gonna go back, see if I can go back. See this picture behind uh, the young lady, her name is Jenny, she's one of the founders. Um, behind her is like one of the first versions of that, which is just a container. And then you see the PVC piping and it's evolved. It's gone through, you know, different uh, designs. It's patented by Isla Urbana. It's something we're very proud of. So we're constantly looking at the system to improve it, to make it more adaptable, make it more economical, user-friendly. Here are the benefits of capturing rain. So as I mentioned, as you saw in the last system, uh, and when things got all started, um, they get six to eight months of water that is theirs. So when it falls on your roof and you collect it and you manage it, no one can take that from you. Um, no one can all of a sudden, you know, you're not gonna show up to deliver your water or a lot of people, that, something that I'm not sure I mentioned uh, is that they may get their water, but it's intermittent. So it may be turned off. So a large, I wanna say 70% of residents in Mexico City they have that type of water. So your water may be turned off you know, between Monday and Wednesday, or you only get it on these days between 12 and five, or it, it depends. And so you don't have to worry about that. That's yours and you manage it. Uh, it saves you money, definitely, because uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned is that when we have these issues worldwide, it's really those people that the people that are most marginalized and low income that suffer the consequences the most. And so here in Mexico, I'm just off the top of my head, like a neighborhood that has a lot of, you know, that is wealthy and is, you know, if you want to visit, it's very nice. Maybe you would go there and you're not going to even know that there's a water situation, but they're connected to the red, to the network. I said red because that's um, in Spanish, la red. So they're connected to the network. They can wash their dishes. They can take a shower without thinking twice. But then when you go in these other communities that I just showed you, it's very different. Uh, your water may be turned off. You have to wait, the circumstances that I've explained. And that adds up with you purchasing water from donkeys, with you having to go to the corner store to buy a gallon of water, with you having to wait for this truck. These people, it's estimated that they have to pay about 20% of income of, in their water. And I don't know about you, but when I look at my monthly budget, I don't think, oh, 20% has to go to water. And so it really is an injustice that this happens. And for us to be able to save them that money for six to eight months of the year in, in urban areas is huge. Uh, in rural zones, it can save them 
the entire year. So of, of having to go and look for water. So we have some rural communities that they live off of that water all year long. Um, they we've talked about the water resiliency and becoming independent. We're of course recharging our aquifers by not over exploiting them. Uh, we're not needing to pump water from wells or anywhere else, um, saving energy and then on contamination because as you can imagine all those trucks going up and down hills and all over Mexico. Um, we're saving on that as well. So these are amazing benefits to rainwater harvesting. And here is, I don't know, hopefully uh, Elisa maybe, or Sarah, you could unmute yourself, but can you see, you only see my, my presentation on here, right? Because I want to make sure you see the system, like the, the six uh, parts of how the system works and not everyone's faces. Let me know if you can't yep. see them. Yeah. Can see it. Awesome, thank you. So you have uh, six steps here. The one you've seen, the Tlaloque, we've talked about it being the first flush. And it's called the Tlaloque because uh, it's named after Tlaloc, um, the Aztec rain god. And it really separates those first five to 15 minutes of rain, which are the most contaminated and it ends up being 75% of filtration here. Um, and so it's the most important component. And then uh, first, of course, it falls on your roof, then it comes down through the gutters into the Tlaloque. It goes in through, pumped, goes up to uh, the leaf filter. Uh, and you know, rocks and leaves and things like that won't get in there. And then it will go in through a turbulence reducer. Uh, which is like a calm in inlet uh, that when the water comes in and won't make a splash. So any sediments or anything that's kind of any kind of dirt or anything uh, will stay at the very bottom. And you have a chlorine dispenser, like a pool, you can say, you know, how pools have those as well. Um, and then you have a floating suction valve. So that'll take water from the very top layer. So it's the cleanest water is taken out. And then it will come out to um, your filters. So you have two different types of filters. Uh, one is for sediments uh, to 50 microns. I think, you know, it's like a, one hair, like as thin as a hair. Uh, you have a carbon activated one as well after that. And so things like, you know, smells or color or anything like that are taken care of. And then it's pumped, pumped up to the roof, um, letting that go on top and then distributed through the home. This is not um, something that we invented. This has been around for thousands of years. Um, you know, our ancestors did this. So a lot of people, if anyone says, I invented rainwater harvesting. No, you did not. It's been around for a very long time. Um, this is just, you know, these are the steps that us as I would say, uh, Isorban in Mexico are definitely, everyone that's out there installing, the founders of Mexico are experts, the founders of Isla Urbana in Mexico are experts in this. And these are the steps that you need to take to properly um, harvest the rain. So our motto is uh, rainwater for all. And we've developed a hybrid model uh, that works in you know, rural, urban schools, and uh, yeah, we have, um, we mainly install in homes and in schools. We have installed, we do install in uh, community centers. We have installed in hospitals as well, our health clinics. And we're gonna chat with you to uh, show you like the different types of places where we're installing and kind of show you a little bit of, you know, what that entails. Um, so our rain schools program, Escuelas de Lluvia, is really a beautiful program. Um, for us, it's never about installing and then bye, we're out. It's always a, the social aspect is incredibly important. And especially in schools, we talked about this earlier, how, you know, a lot of kids have preventable diseases that they die from. Uh, because of this lack of water and sanitation. So we not only install systems, rainwater harvesting systems, we also install hand washing stations. And this comes with um, workshops and a lot of, you know, um, conversations with school staff and parents where we're talking about the water cycle, sustainability, and where a lot of them uh, participate in a lot of environmental education. So it's, it's a whole program where there are various visits and there is a beautiful ceremony and inauguration of systems. And the kids come out with like these clouds that, and things that they've drawn and they've put together. And it's about, you know, the kids really understanding how the system works. The parents also understand how the system works and they come together and really 
like feel the importance of this. So we we love the the project, and it's a it's a great program to invest in. Um, so we have, you know, our projects include um, some level social activity as I've mentioned, but it's it's always um, art is always somewhere around the corner. So we have, if you go to any of those schools that where we've installed, you will see some of these murals. Uh, and you'll also go to neighborhoods where we've, we've installed, you'll see them there as well. In very rural areas, you'll see these type of murals and really they're about the life cycle. They bring in uh, cultural aspects. The, we bring in really professional muralists, but also the community gives us ideas and they help to put this together. And it's a really important part uh, of, again, like touching on the social aspect, uh, building trust, it, it comes first, the community wanting the system, not just needing the system, is also very important for us to install. So while there is a lot of need, it has to be sustainable. There are many projects around the world where things are done and things are created and things are implemented. But if someone doesn't understand how they work and there isn't a real acceptance of them, it's a project that may go to waste and we don't want that to ever happen. Here are some other pictures of um, some of the urban systems. And on the right, you will see that uh, there's a, like water quality testing that's happening. Um, so, you know, public water supply has to comply with current norms. And so it needs to be monitored, um, especially with large scale programs. And so our water is tested. And so it's important that, you know, we do that in front of the, the user and that they see how this is, you know, an accountability thing with us as well. I mean, they see it in their quality of water, just as you know, when they harvest it and they see how clear it comes out. Even some of the water sometimes that's delivered that they purchase will be brown or yellow. That's not something that you will see with our systems if it is properly harvested and those six steps are followed. So that's where it can get tricky. Um, if someone on their roof has you know dogs and they keep things on on their roofs um if they are not ever cleaning their cistern um or you know the the maintenance of it is not really very heavy it's something that i my background is social work and non-profit uh, non-profit administration i know how to maintain a rainwater harvesting system and it's not because i've been working here for this long it's this is something i learned right away you know you empty out the tlaloque. Uh, you have to make sure your cistern is sealed. One of the filters you take out and literally with a toothbrush, you wash it. Uh, these are, and uh, you keep your roof clean. These are very basic things and our systems can last, they should last at least 20 years. So it's, they're built to last. They're very adaptable. They're user-friendly and we're always looking to, uh, to maintain that. Um, so there are, Rural projects that we have worked on since we started throughout the country, and there are three main ones that um, we're focused on. Uh, one is Hatatukari, which is water our life in the Huichol language. It's for the Huichol community in Jalisco. Uh, there's a Mazateca project in um, the state of Oaxaca, Raramuri in Chihuahua with the Tarumaras. And each one is different for sure, uh, just, even with, with the Hata Tukari, we've been there since 2009. We've installed many systems, hundreds and hundreds of systems there. Uh, we've provided clean access to clean water through those systems for our two full communities. And we're going to like, we finished these two, now let's go to the next one and the next one, the next one. Um, Mazateca is, I, I'm gonna wait to get to those other slides and talk a little bit more in depth. But what I do wanna say about these three is that like the first two, Hata Tukari and Mazateca, they have larger cisterns that are about 16,000 liters. The ones you've been looking at uh, in urban settings are give or take 5,000 liter, 5,000 5, liters. And these are like the one she's standing next to, it looks like a little pool, which it is. And um, the one, the last one, Ramuri, is a little bit different because they are a little more, uh, they rains a little less there. And also um, they use a different kind of calabash cistern that you're about to learn about in, in a second. And if you can see that the Tlaloque now became a lot smaller and it has a different shape. And that's because they don't deal with the contamination that they deal, that we deal with here in the city. And also their roofs are smaller. So it takes a different type of first flush. 
And here's a really beautiful picture of, you know, the art, again, the murals taking place. And yeah, sometimes they happen on the cisterns themselves. And this is in with the Raramuri. I'm going to show a video and hopefully I'm hoping it'll load. Um, let's see. And just take a look at this work with the Raramuri. It's about eight min minutes, so. Let me know if you cannot hear it. Can you turn it up a little bit, please? Yeah, you know. It's as turned up as I can, but it's about to have subtitles. See if that helps. Thank you. five hours for the truck to get here. And you can think of all the emissions and, and the gas it uses to, to bring a, a tank of 10,000 liters. Uh, and then they don't come on time, they come a week late. So, um, and just accessibility to, to basic services such as water is a big problem. Um, it's very hard here to build a well and pump water and build a distribution network and get piped water to every house. It's almost impossible. Now, like the climate has been changing. It's not raining as, uh, as steadily and as frequently as it did before. So it's especially hard now to grow food. And so all of this creates an incredibly complicated scenario where water access and in general, just kind of survival have become more and more difficult. These are communities that are politically marginalized as so many indigenous communities are in the country and all over the world. They're geographically complicated. We're in the middle of the Sierra and it's just cliffs and canyons and mountains everywhere. And the convergence of all of these things make it extremely difficult to get water to these communities in any conventional manner at all. This tank that the family is painting right now, this is a model of 